things that really strikes me about this movie is um, some of the uh, challenges to uh, social, racial norms of the time. And I'd like anybody who has anything to say to kind of talk about that at the time. You know, I mean, like, um, I found it very challenging to what I thought 1968 was about when I saw it 20 years later. You know, let's let George ask that because your character actually is exactly what he's talking about in that film about the racial tension that was happening back then. Well, the sheriff as my character was a redneck. Yeah. And you got a dirty job to do, let's get it done, kill him. It don't matter how, just kill him. But the climate was such that when the picture was taken to New York to be shown to the exhibitor, Martin Luther King was killed. Wow. And introducing that film with the male lead getting killed at the end, there would be sort of a frictional controversy. But it was all overcome and things just happened and it went well. They, I think probably what, what uh, Dave is, is leading toward, in 1968, um, putting a black man in the lead in a movie yeah. was a little bit outside some people's boundaries. And then strengthen the, the white woman, like like slapping her, like back slapping her. The, 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 the sole singular reason why Ben ended up as a black man, because he was the best actor who auditioned for the yeah. part. <laughs> Nothing more complicated than that. <laughs> now, did we think, are we going to take some crap for having a black man and a white woman hole up in an abandoned farmhouse together? Yes, we knew that people would say, uh, you guys are playing with fire here. Did we realize when she hauls off and smacks Ben because, oh, again, I have to shut up. You got to let the cat out of there. I'm sure that they have been told about this movie. They'll get over it. They'll get over it. There's another part to that, too, because. Aside from the film, it had nothing to do with the film, but don't forget George Wallace was governor of Alabama and was right. denied anyone admission. And the federal government had to overturn his ruling and get him out of there to allow segregation to take place. Wow. I mean integration. Yeah. Yeah. He, but, but, Wallace but, wanted segregation. But see, the thing about us at that time, we were the kind of people that like to give breaks to people that didn't get breaks. And whether they were blacks or whether they were musicians that couldn't get good gigs and, and things like that. We threw open our studio doors to allow, and Pittsburgh is like a big music city. You know, and, I mean, Remember we're in Nashville. But Pittsburgh in a different way. Pittsburgh still turns out a lot of noted musicians, but they did, and they used to have to play just straight up and down gigs, wedding gigs, and kind of sedate kind of stuff. And here they have the temperament of jazz musicians, and so we used to try to get them. We used to try to talk our clients into doing original scores and give these guys a break. And then we said to them one day. Um, what can we do for you? What, what would help? They said if we only had a place to jam, the people wouldn't cuss us out and call the cops on us for making noise and things like that. So we threw up our studio doors for jam sessions on uh, uh, Saturday nights, and guys would leave their straight up and down boring gigs and come there. And pretty soon, we had 50, 60 musicians show up. Wow. On a Saturday Just night jamming. after their gig, you know, and <laughs> even the director up. of the Pittsburgh Symphony came and. The guys that like Jimmy Blakemore used to, great drummer ended up playing he played with Jack Jones for the remainder of his school for years. There, or two there was one night in our building, uh, which we had two floors of the building and we had studios on both floors. Woody Herman's entire band showed up. Now Woody Herman had an eighteen piece band, <laughs> if you can imagine. Well, we got busted. 
police find that it's four o'clock on a Saturday, uh, Sunday morning, and there are cars lining the streets every Saturday, sun, Saturday night, Sunday morning. And the police came and said, What are you guys doing here? They said, We didn't have a cabaret license. We're, 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 yeah, we're, uh, that was a public <laughs> gathering. <laughs> They said, you have this party every Saturday night, Sunday morning. Yeah, we've got some musician friends. Do you have a public gathering for me? And I have to tell you that at that time, we had no political clout or pool or anything in Pittsburgh. And so, you know, we stopped it because we knew sooner or later we were going to really get busted. But it was a great time, absolutely wonderful, you know, free you know, musicians showing up. You have, you know, two studios full of musicians playing because they want to play. But I, and another thing that happened was when Dwayne Jones has been read for the part, other people who were under consideration for that part says, we're not your guy, he is. <laughs> yeah, and they were people who were part of our group. You know, it could have been a... Uh, <coughs> Nepotism kind of thing, you know, mm -hmm. didn't come into it. We didn't say he's our buddy, he's getting a part. We said Dwayne's the guy, he did the best reading. Huh. And by the way, uh, Dwayne came from a very educated family. His sister was a, had a Harvard law degree and became the city solicitor in Atlanta. And when we were having uh, the night when we did 25th Grant reunion celebration song, he's ever read it in 93, 1993. Then I got in touch with Dwayne's mother and his sister, and she she was the city solicitor there at the time when the, when the Olympics happened and that bomb went off. So, you know, there are so many um, coincidental kind of uh, things like that. With the story. We, we could tell you these kind of stories all night, just little tidbits of, you know, interesting trivia that happened around this movie. Any other questions? <clears throat> Who did the makeup for Mary Little Dead? That was primarily uh, Carl Hardman and Marilyn Eastman. Okay. It was one of the assignments. We all did different things at different times, you know, story ideas and this and that and the other thing. It was basically a group of people saying, okay, what needs to be done and who will do it. Mm -hmm. The makeup uh, fell primarily to Carl and Marilyn. And uh, I think they did a, you know, a very good job. Neither of them were practiced in what is now called special makeup effects, uh, which has become a science in itself. But uh, they did a very uh, excellent job with, you know, they do basic stage makeup and that kind of thing, but not into the, to the degree. Well, we didn't even have silicone, you know. We didn't. We had. We, Carl found some jar of dermal wax. <laughs> that was the wax, that was what morticians used. The nose was taken off the car accident. Uh, that, was, uh, that shit when it was put on my face. <laughs> <laughs> it was off of the table knife. Like, <laughs> it was going to hurt like hell. But that's all we had to do, that stuff. We, you know, it was all done with ingenuity and just total zeal and dedication. And we made it work. Wow. But, you know, to get back with to the, the questions about the political things, when I was doing the rewrite and the write of the second writing of the second half and so on, I knew well, you had to think about, okay, the girl slaps him, should he knock her off or not? Not down, we need to get her knocked out. Why do we need to get her knocked out? We weren't sure we could cast an actress good enough to carry a part all the way through a movie. The easiest thing to do was have her be knocked out and go catatonic. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, God, you know, people are going to believe that in the heat of the moment, this nice guy is going to just lose it for a moment and punch her. And I'm thinking, and I know damn well when I'm writing it, that in the South at that time, in the segregated South, that, you know, we had to get her coat off her because she couldn't spend the whole shooting schedule under hot movie lights in those days, hot, real hot lights. Mm -hmm. 
So we had to get her coat off. So we laser her down on the couch and opened some cup. You know damn well people are going to think, what's this guy going to do to her now? You know? Mm -hmm. But it was, all of that was going through my head, I swear. So he but took the coat he, off. Oh, not, he, all he does is unbuttons the coat and opens it so that the yeah. next time it was a practical matter. She had to shrug her way out of that coat. But somebody had to start the process. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, and, and that's the way, you know, we, we teach our students now, unless and I co direct the movie making program. We try to teach them a lot of script writing, a lot of concept. It's problem solving. But when you solve those problems, it can't end up being hokey to the audience. It has to be believable. You can't just do something in the simplest goddamn way, but it's not believable. You know, and, so, and one way or another, we made it work. The pirate, originally, were you, your character was, an, was supposed to be a boy, wasn't it? That's, yeah, that's what I, well, John wrote it to be a boy, yeah. right? The boy was named Timmy. Timmy. <laughs> and the only reason we changed it to Karen because Carl said, I think my daughter can do this part great. We don't have to go on the cast of boy. And we don't have to have put up with his parents being on the set and what their schedule is. What's your daughter doing? <laughs> so, you know, and another major change was in the middle of the script that the Tom character was. 42-year-old cemetery caretaker that it was down in the basement with the Cooper family. And then we thought we need a good-looking young girl, a sexy girl, because all horror films have them and besides that's what we wanted a good-looking sexy we were all young men with our raging hormones. <laughs> Let's get a good-looking sexy girl in this movie. So we cast Judy Ridley, who we all knew. She was actually Carl's uh, receptionist. receptionist wow. And uh, so by then we made Tom be her younger and now he's her boyfriend, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, which we didn't even have to rewrite or anything, we just did it. But the only scene, that, once we did that, we needed a scene that got empathy for them. And they are, so we did the one where they're doing the all with all cocktails and they're having that conversation. And I was so punchy and tired, I couldn't think of the damn thing. And keep plane was flying in that morning. And we had to shoot a scene, and George and I were sitting under a great barber trying to come up with an idea. And my mind was all totally blank. And George wrote that scene. And I was so relieved he wrote it.